The text for the sermon this afternoon is the Word of God as we have it summarized in Lord's Day 36, question and answer 99 and 100. Lord's Day 36 is about the third commandment, and the third commandment reads as follows. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now we confess as Church of Jesus Christ in Lord's Day 36, what is required in the third commandment. We are not to blaspheme or to abuse the name of God by cursing, perjury, or unnecessary oaths, nor to share in such horrible sins by being silent bystanders. Rather, we must use the holy name of God only with fear and reverence so that we may rightly confess him, call upon him, and praise him in all our words and works. Is the blaspheming of God's name by swearing and cursing such a grievous sin that God is angry also with those who do not prevent and forbid it as much as they can. Certainly, for no sin is greater or provokes God's wrath more than the blaspheming of his name. That is why he commanded it to be punished with death. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, at the beginning of this worship service, we sang from Psalm 8, where David praises God for his great and majestic name. The Lord has displayed the great majesty of his name in the heavens above. He has also created man in order that he might praise and glorify him and exalt him, his God and creator. Even out of the mouths of infants and children, the Lord has ordained praise. Also, all the children here have already received the task to praise God with their whole being. And when you boys and girls also praise the Lord, Then you put to silence the wicked, who in their wickedness curse the name of God and do not want to bring glory to his name. What an amazing Lord and God who is able to silence evil men through the babbling of infants and the songs of children. David speaks of the children here to show that the Lord is busy establishing his kingdom on this earth, and his kingdom has a glorious future and will prevail. God's work of renewal and his majesty will prevail, even though the evil one tries to prevent it in many ways. The evildoer's course will be broken, and God will be glorified. His name will be praised in the kingdom that he is establishing in this world. As God's children now in our time, we are called to keep his commandments and in this way also to glorify God's name and thank him for the redemption that he has given to us in Jesus Christ, his son. We may be present here this afternoon as the redeemed and chosen people of God, He has chosen us for a special task to be his image bearers in this world, to be a light on a hill and the salt of the earth. He has chosen us so that we would more and more be conformed to his image and that we would reflect his glory in this world. We may be the ones with whom God has made an everlasting covenant from generation to generation, And therefore, we also have the obligation to live in accordance with his will. The promises of God come hand in hand with the obligations we have towards him. And God shows us these obligations in his ten words of the covenant. 
of which we will consider the third this afternoon. The third commandment concerns the name of the Lord. His name is the name which is exalted above every name, and it must be used in a way that is fitting with this reality of God's glory and majesty. It must not be used frivolously or flippantly or in hostility. It must never be misused because then God himself is dishonored and even attacked. When God's name is taken in vain, then God, the holy and majestic one, is made fun of and ridiculed. And this is the most serious because it concerns the eternal and all-powerful God, the only true God, who must always be praised and glorified because of who he is. Therefore, sin against the third commandment is taken so seriously by God. In the commandment itself, God says that he will not hold anyone guiltless who takes his name in vain, such people will most certainly be punished. Let us consider the third commandment this afternoon from the vantage point of its utmost seriousness. I proclaim to you God's word under the following theme. Blasphemy is the most direct sin against God himself. We'll see first the nature of this sin, second the seriousness of this sin, and third, the opposite of this sin. Sin against the third commandment <clears throat> in the form of blasphemy is a direct attack against God and his integrity and glory and is the most serious sin possible. Why is this the case? because it is a sin that is aimed directly at God. It is not a sin which concerns another creature in God's creation. It is not a sin which neglects God or ignores him. It is not a sin which concerns the keeping of the holy days of God or of the honoring of our neighbor's possessions or anything of that kind. Such sins are, of, co of course, also very serious and very grievous in God's sight. But the blaspheming of his name and dragging his name through the mud by abusing it or cursing is a sin which attacks God directly and therefore is taken so seriously by God. The Catechism also has a special question and answer devoted to this very point. We confess in question and answer 100, is the blaspheming of God's name by swearing and cursing such a grievous sin that God is angry also with those who do not prevent it and forbid it as much as they can? Certainly, for no sin is greater or provokes God's wrath more than the blaspheming of his name. That is why he commanded it to be punished with death. What exactly is the nature of this sin? The key aspect of the sin of blasphemy is its deliberate character. Blasphemy is not committed accidentally or out of the weakness of the flesh. But the sin of blasphemy, that sin of attacking God directly, is a sin which is done out of a hardness of heart and out of hatred for God. Blasphemy is not a simple stumbling in one's walk with God, but it is a deliberate turning away from God and an expression of hatred for the good will of God. Blasphemy, in the highest sense of the word, is not a defaming of God's name by those who are completely ignorant of God, as so many in this society have become. There are many today who use God's name very flippantly and use the name of Jesus Christ as a swear word. Such sins are, of course, very grievous in God's sight. But as grievous as these sins are, 
For many, it is done out of ignorance. And though they blaspheme God's name, it is not necessarily done with an upraised hand in defiance against the Creator. There are also many who do deliberately attack the Lord and want nothing to do with His will in their lives and therefore abuse His name. Such people are certainly guilty of blasphemy in this most serious sense. In our scripture reading from Numbers 15, we receive insights into this deeper sense of the third commandment. After Moses speaks about the offerings, which are for unintentional sins, or better translated as sins done in weakness, in verses 30 and 31, he writes, But the person who does anything with a high hand, whether he is a native or the sojourner, reviles or blasphemes the Lord. And that person shall be cut off from among his people because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment. That person shall be utterly cut off. His iniquity shall be on him. Here, sinning with a high hand, in whatever area of life, in whatever circumstances, is equated with blaspheming the Lord. Such a person shows that he has no regard for the Lord and no respect for his name, for his identity as his creator. And the one who has promised him many rich blessings through the covenant bond that he has established also with this Israelite. Because this person acts like this over against his Lord, he must receive the death penalty and be utterly cut off from the people of God. Now if this was the character of blasphemy in the Old Covenant then what is its character in the new dispensation? After the glory of God's name has been revealed that much more clearly in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What does it mean to blaspheme the Lord in the most serious sense of this word in the new covenant? This is the sin against the Holy Spirit. This is the unforgivable sin. The only sin which is unforgivable. What does this mean? Why is it unforgivable? To understand the character of this sin, and the reason for its name as sin against the Holy Spirit, we need to carefully consider the two other passages which we read, and understand their proper place in the History of God's revelation to his people. In Matthew 12, we read the account of Jesus healing a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute. The people were amazed at what Christ had done, and they wondered whether this was the son of David. They were open to the possibility that he would be the long-awaited Messiah. But how did the Pharisees react to this miracle of the Lord Jesus. Instead of wonder at this clear evidence of God's goodness and love, they openly ridiculed and scorned Jesus by saying, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Now it is clear that no demon would have the power to heal a blind and mute man. It is only within God's power to do such a thing. Therefore, by deliberately mocking Jesus, in spite of the fact that he had done such an act of healing and goodness, they were committing the sin of blasphemy. But in his words to them, Jesus says that there is still time for them to repent of their sin. They have not yet committed the unforgivable sin because they spoke against the Son of Man in his humiliated state. 
They were not yet without any excuse at all, because the Son of Man had not yet been glorified and proclaimed to all as the Son of God who had come to offer himself for the forgiveness of sins, which was sufficient to cleanse all men from their sins. The Lord Jesus says in verse 31 of Matthew 12 that the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And in verse 32, he says that whoever speaks a word against the Spirit will not be forgiven. What does this mean? Why will this particular sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit not be forgiven? To understand this, we need to keep in mind the situation of the history of redemption when Jesus spoke these words. We also need to remember that the true God is the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is only one God in three persons. It is not possible to sin against the Holy Spirit and not affect God the Father and God the Son as well. When the Lord Jesus speaks about the Holy Spirit here in Matthew 12, then he is not referring to the third person of the Trinity as such, but he is speaking about a specific time in God's revealing himself to his people, the time after Pentecost, the age of the Holy Spirit. After the Lord Jesus had completed his work of humiliation and suffering, the road of mocking and ridicule, of sweating blood, and being crucified, and being sent to hell and to the grave, he arose from the dead and ascended into heaven. And from there he sent his Spirit to the church. The Holy Spirit had never been given to the people of God in such a way before. On Pentecost, the last chapter of God's history of Revelation has begun. Now the Holy Spirit is active among God's people, and by means of the Scriptures, he shows to the church that the Lord Jesus has indeed been glorified. There is now no longer any excuse for ignorance about the true nature of Jesus Christ and the purpose of his coming into the world. The fact that he has risen from the dead, ascended into heaven, shows very clearly to the whole world that this was indeed the Messiah sent from God. God himself has shown through the resurrection and the ascension that he has accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and has demonstrated to everyone that this is the solution to the problem of our sins. There is no other Savior but Jesus Christ alone. In Christ, the revelation of the name of God is complete. It is this message which has been fully revealed in the New Testament, which has come to us in the age of the Holy Spirit. The sin against the Holy Spirit is the rejection of this full revelation of the name of God as this has become clear in Jesus Christ. The sin against the Holy Spirit is the denial of the message of the gospel of salvation through Christ alone, as this has been fully revealed in the writings the Holy Spirit has inspired, and which have been given to the church as the word of God. When the Christ of God is glorified, and revealed very clearly as the Son of God who came to save sinners, and then yet is blasphemed and rejected and denied out of hand with an upraised hand, then the unforgivable sin is committed. When the Christ is glorified and revealed by the Spirit of God, and yet rejected, then there is no forgiveness possible for such a sin. When the name of God, 
has been fully revealed in Jesus Christ, glorified and resurrected, then there is no longer any excuse possible for not believing in Christ. For then he has been shown to be who he really is, the great gift of God's love to a sinful mankind. Then the supreme greatness of God's name in all of its depth and breadth will be manifest and will be made known to everyone. When that glorified name of God as revealed in Jesus Christ, crucified and resurrected, when that glorified name of God is attacked and ridiculed, then such a sin cannot be forgiven. For such a sin is defiant and deliberate. It is a sin which delights in mocking the love of God, and therefore the love of God will be withheld from such a person. This rejection of Jesus Christ is blasphemy in the deepest sense of the word. The author of the letter to the Hebrews speaks of this sin against the Holy Spirit. He is writing to those who have received knowledge of God's name as revealed in Jesus Christ. He writes to those who are in the covenant of God and know who Christ is and what he has done for them. They know that in him they may receive the forgiveness of sins. It is to such people as them and to such people as us who, like them, share in the covenant of God and have a full knowledge of Christ, that this warning comes in full earnest. The author writes in chapter 10, verse 26 and 27, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. The people of Israel were punished by death when they sinned against the law of Moses. And so how much worse will be the punishment against those who trample God's Son underfoot and profane the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. Such sin shows a deep contempt for God and a devilish hatred of God. This sin is very deliberate. It takes pleasure in hurting God and rejecting his love. Those who commit this sin also never seek forgiveness because they are filled with hatred and despise the very thing which could give them forgiveness. They have no regret or shame. They delight in quenching the fire of the Holy Spirit in their lives and rejoice in blaspheming the Lord. Such people can only expect the judgment and wrath of God to come upon them. So we come to the second point, the seriousness of this sin. It is clear that this sin is the most serious kind of sin there is because it is so direct and deliberately hateful towards God. And therefore this sin is unforgivable. The sins of the old covenant were punished with death, but this sin is punished with eternal death. This sin comes with the consequences of eternal separation from God. Those who commit this sin will receive what they desire. Their open contempt and hatred of God and his love and kindness will mean that they will never receive God's love and kindness. They will perish eternally in their wickedness and fall into the hands of the living God who judges impartially and gives to each man what his actions deserve. In Matthew 12, Jesus said of this sin that it will not be forgiven either in this age nor in the age to come. 
It is true of all sins that there can be no forgiveness in the age to come because then it will be too late to repent of sin. But this sin against the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven in this age either. Forgiveness is not possible because those who commit it spurn the asking for forgiveness and despise that which can give them forgiveness. Brothers and sisters, the unforgivable sin against the Holy Spirit, the ultimate sin of blasphemy, this sin against the third commandment is a most serious matter. And as people of God, we are in the best position to hate and flee from this sin because we have experienced God's goodness and grace in our lives. But we are also in the best position to commit this sin because we are not ignorant of God's ways, but rather know them well. And therefore, how necessary it is to heed these warnings in Scripture about this unforgivable sin. Let us always be on our guard that we treat the Word of God with the utmost respect and believe its message of the glad tidings of Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected and ascended. May we ever be vigilant that we do not begin to go down the road which can eventually lead to sin against the Holy Spirit. This road can begin with lax church attendance. And therefore, the author of the letter to the Hebrews also warns against this in the portion that we read. May we also be careful as to how we attend the worship services. For God's name is also dishonored and misused if we attend church in a frivolous and irreverent way, or if we show no regard for the proclamation of the word, the despising of the preaching and the scripture message that is brought can become the most serious blasphemy. In the past, this topic of the unforgivable sin has caused much consternation and unrest among God's people. There were many who were worried sick that they had committed sin against the Holy Spirit. Precisely because it is those who know the truth so well who are in the best position to commit it, many worried that they had done this and therefore could not be forgiven. But let us not get caught up in such worry and grief. For this sin against the Holy Spirit is a very deliberate and calculated sin. It is a sin which has hardened itself in the deepest possible way. It is a sin which delights in sin and wickedness and seeks to hate God as much as possible. Those who commit this sin do not want to confess it and do not experience it as a sin against God as such, but rather as a mocking and ridicule of God. Beloved in the Lord, the Lord will never reject those who cry out to him in despair and anguish of soul. If you worry that you have committed the unforgivable sin, or if you worry that your particular sin against which you struggle and fight is too much for God to forgive, then take heart and be encouraged by the depth of God's love and compassion for you, a repentant sinner. Never forget that God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to save sinners, not to condemn them. Those who delight in sin are condemned already, but those who fight against it and are ashamed of it need not despair of God's mercy, nor should they continue in sin. Rather, trust in God's covenant promises and rejoice in the salvation which Jesus Christ has given. Instead of worrying about having blasphemed God's name, rather act positively in God's service and praise Him with all of your heart and soul. And so we come to the third point, the opposite 
of this sin. We have seen the great depth of the sin of blasphemy of God's name in the new covenant era, the time of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, we must not remain at the level of the explanation of the sin against the third commandment. But we must also speak about how to obey the third commandment in a positive way. And the wonderful news is that the new covenant, the age of the Holy Spirit, is also the time for the richest opportunities of praising and honoring God's name. For we may know the full revelation of the name of God and the wonders he has brought about in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We have so many reasons to praise and honor the name of our God. He has shown us the depth of his love and compassion by sending his very own Son to save us. What fools we would be if we would reject and spurn such amazing love. He has provided us with all that we need to live in his service with joy and thanksgiving. He has given us his spirit to dwell in us and transform us and make us to share in the benefits which Christ has obtained for us. He has given us rich and lasting hope for the future and promises which help us in our present calling that we have received from him. Let us always show our love for the Lord and his mercies by using his great and holy name with fear and reverence. May we always be conscious of our status before him as creatures who do not deserve his rich favors, but rather his punishment and wrath. Nevertheless, he has shown to us his mercy and given to us his steadfast love. May we always desire to give him all the glory for what he has done for us. Let us confess his name to all those around us and exude joy and delight in every opportunity making the most of every moment, for the time is short till the return of our Savior. May we call upon him faithfully and seek him in all that we do. Let us walk with him and speak to him freely of our needs and concerns, of our adoration for his greatness and holiness, and thank him for his gifts to us openly confess our shortcomings and express to him our desire to live for him always. May all our words, thoughts, and actions be geared to one goal only, the praise and glory of God's holy name. Amen.